Uh, okay, so we're recording. Let me start play. Okay, well, welcome everyone to Camera Settings Simplified. So what is the purpose of this webinar? Um, there's a few I want to start with. Um, you know, these instruments are so capable these days. There's so many functions and sophisticated technology. So why do we actually need to simplify the interface with these amazing devices? That if you, you know, most of the times, if you put these on auto mode, they're going to do a reasonable job and you don't have to really think about anything. And there is some real benefit of that, which is why I'm, partly why I'm wanting to offer this is how can we actually simplify the interface with our cameras so that we can pay attention to what we really love to photograph. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this webinar is because, well, few. I see a lot of people struggle in the field with camera settings and don't really understand the purpose of the primary camera settings. And a big motivation is that I don't think we should leave the creative decisions to our camera because they can do a reasonable job, let's say most or some of the times, but the more that we push our creative boundaries, the less capable these cameras become. The cameras in auto mode are making a lot of the creative choices for us. And that may or may not fit with our creative vision or the story we're trying to tell through the image making. So I think there's really great value in actually trying to simplify just how sophisticated these are. You know, these cameras now, these modern cameras have more computing power, power than um, NASA computers did even 30 years ago. So it's amazing what they can do. But I think there's also, and, and it's worth knowing a lot of what they can do. I really encourage anyone attending my workshops or working with me privately, one of the requirements is, you know, read your camera manual two or three times so that you understand how to find the settings so that when I'm guiding you through settings, you know where they are. You know how to change aperture, shutter speed, ISO, et cetera. So there's real value in knowing the different functions of these cameras, but then to actually simplify to just the essential functions of the camera. Photography presents a very unique challenge in my mind in that it requires a wide spectrum of capacities and skill sets of us. Cameras will, when we start to get into more of the technical aspect of photography, this requires a lot of left brain logic of just linear thinking of sequence and problem solving. And that's a really important aspect of photography. Once you can get, once you have some level of mastery or confidence with the technical aspect, then, then really the creative art of photography just opens up. It's sort of like this unbounded artistic potential with photography, which requires a very different skill set and very different capacity in our nervous system, much more right brain function and more creative nonlinear thinking and a very fluid capacity to be um, in thought and feeling and sense simultaneously. So it's, it's a really complex challenge and marriage of all these different skill sets and capacities that need to come together so that we can um, be in both the technical and creative experience simultaneously and not have one or the other shut us down. And I think this is partly why people tend to want to just put the camera on auto mode and allow the camera to make those technical decisions for you so that you can be more in the creative expression. But often what happens is we get the images back home and we realize that the camera didn't do a really good job of, of um, translating our creative expression or creative intent. So I think this is the real value, the core value of what 
this simple webinar can offer you. So let's move into this. I think it's really important to recognize that we are the primary instrument of creativity and not the camera. We think of these, yes, they can, they can have creative effects and, and, and we can work with artistic settings, but it's not the camera. The camera isn't doing that. So it's really important that we come central to the recognition that we are the primary drive, the creative drive or the instrument in the moment, not the camera. And to really take that creativity and the artistic intent back into our awareness and back into our skill sets. And recognize that we have a profound relationship to light. And it, we see this in how we, we see this through the seasons. We see this every 24 hours as we go in and out of sleep and waking consciousness. Light dramatically impacts us as human beings and all life forms. But we have a very special relationship to light. And from, from in my experience, the way I feel it is that we're really dynamic receptors and reflectors of light. And that really can inform, strongly influence and inform our creative intent and creative expression in the moment. And um, again, we don't want to just trust that the camera can make all these decisions for us and these creative translations for us. Um, Ultimately, what your camera attempts to do, and I'll go into this a uh, little bit in more detail, is attempt to turn everything, all light, into 18% gray. It's trying to neutralize light. And a lot of times, when you start to reflect back on your own work or the work of other really skilled photographers, what actually brings us alive and really emotionally moved by a photograph is the dynamic spectrum of light. It's the whole spectrum of light. The camera is going to try to neutralize light to an 18%. It's going to take whatever's really bright in the photo, like this spirit bear in the slide, or the dark tones in the forest trees, and it's going to try to neutralize those to 18% gray, which does not make a very dramatic photo, and it doesn't create emotional response to the image. So we want to take control of those. So we take control of the experience of light and then how we translate that light through the manipulation and modification of camera settings. So that's essentially what this is about. Now, again, there's there's a right brain way of looking at camera settings and a left brain way of looking at camera settings. Left brain, more logical linear, um, would be that these are ways to just control light, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, exposure compensation, focal sensor placement, just simply ways to control light. And a couple slides in, you'll see that there's also a very creative way to look and relate to camera settings, that they can be much more about the creativity of what each one of these camera settings allows us to control. So the best ways to learn about your camera. I think the best way is low stakes practice. And what I mean by that is like what you could just do in your backyard or in a close park nearby, that there's not a lot of stakes at risk here. What you don't want to do is go out on a photo trip or a, a, an amazing location and start to learn your camera there. That's not the best way to learn your camera. That's what I call high stakes practice. And it usually doesn't result in good, it doesn't end in good results because we're spending more time trying to figure out the camera then we are paying attention to what we're photographing. So yeah, low stakes practice. Go out in your backyard, start to experiment with camera settings. I have a whole slew of practices that I work with, with people when I'm doing private coaching of 
backyard practices for depth of field, for exposure compensation, for understanding um, focus, for under, understanding focal sensor placement. Uh, really, it's just the best way to do it. Read your camera manual at home, go out in your backyard when the light's not great, and just practice what I'm gonna share with you and it will improve your photography heaps. So from a right brain perspective, what's the importance of these camera settings? Well, let's go back a couple of slides here. This is more um, left brain, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, exposure comp, focal sensor placement, just ways to control light in your camera. But they're much more than that, actually. When we start to look at it from a creative or artistic expression point of view, aperture allows us to control what I call depth of focus, or you can also think of it as depth of attention. How far into your scene does your attention or the viewer's attention go? This is a, this is a product of aperture setting. Shutter speed is about controlling movement. You know, we can go from very fast shutter speeds to very slow shutter speeds. And depending on what is the dynamic components of our composition, that's going to give or create a sense of movement. So we can start to control and portray movement with the use of shutter speed, with the intentional use of shutter speed. Another thing when your camera's on auto, um, it's going to try to keep everything at a fairly fast shutter speed, probably 125 at least up to 500, so that whatever movement that is happening in the camera, it's gonna freeze the action because it just assumes that's what we wanna do. But when you start to work with creative, um, the intentional blur of movement in your composition, 125 or 250 or 500th of a second is not sufficient, it's way too fast. So we have to get clear on our creative intent and then we can use things like shutter speed to actually um, create an intentional blur of movement in the photo. Waterfalls, soft water is a really easy, obvious example of this, but there's many, many more. ISO, this allows us to have a better perspective in the dark. We can actually see into the world of of the darkness, of what it doesn't have to be just starlight. There's many things that we could shoot in low light where our camera through the ISO function, as we increase ISO, it's gonna be, it's going to make this, the sensor more sensitive to light. So whatever light's coming in and hitting the sensor, as your ISO increases, it makes that more sensitive. So that really allows the camera and us to have a very different, unique perspective in low light settings. Exposure compensation. This, I'm gonna say that it depends on the kind of camera you shoot. I personally switched to mirrorless a couple of years ago, and now I don't, generally don't need to worry about exposure compensation. When I was shooting with digital DSLRs, I, and I was shooting an aperture priority, I was constantly using exposure compensation. And I'll tease apart the difference there between a DSLR camera and a mirrorless camera as we go through the presentation. Focal sensor placement. This is, you know, when you're looking through the viewfinder and you have this little, um, like Nikons have a little joystick that you can move a focal sensor around in the frame. This is really important because the camera takes very important readings off that focal sensor. It's going to take exposure readings, potentially. It depends on how you have your camera set up, but generally it's going to take an exposure reading off where you place the focal sensor. It's going to take a focus lock off where you put that focal sensor. And that really is a powerful way to um, bring the viewer's attention to exactly where you want it through either the manip manipulation of the exposure or the focus. So that's a, I consider that an essential function 
of camera settings. And so as I go through this, the, present the presentation will be about 45 minutes to an hour, and then I'm gonna keep it open to Q&A at the end. So take your time, make some notes if you wanna, if you have any questions that are coming up, you can certainly go back and review things. But at the end is when I'll address Q&A. Okay, so let's look at these one at a time. We have the five, let's look at them one at a time. Aperture settings, like I mentioned, in sort of the photo world, this is considered depth of field, which sort of makes sense. But I think in my experience, a lot of students have, have struggled with that sort of term of what does that mean? So I shifted it a bit to depth of focus. How deep, like in this, in this photo here of these flowers, um, where I actually focused, put my focal sensor was in the middle of the pink flowers. And then I chose a depth of field because this is a macro scene um, that gave me a very shallow depth of focus, which means we're looking at the depth of this photo from the pink flowers to the blue flowers to the green leaves, all the way to the background foliage behind the green leaves. That would be what I consider the depth of the scene. And how far does the focus travel through that depth or how deep does that focus penetrate into the scene? Uh, because this is also what I consider depth of attention. You can see that what is sharp and in focus here is where your eye goes to first. If you look at the upper right corner, the foliage in the way back right corner, your eye doesn't go there very easily. It's just more void soft space. It doesn't command us to look at it. So this is where I think framing it as depth of attention is useful as well, that once you start to understand the power of aperture settings, you can control where you want the viewer to look and where you want their attention to sort of drop off or just become more diffuse. Our attention is drawn to the areas of most contrast and most detail, which in this case would be the pink flowers. This, I, I forget the exact aperture of this. It was probably around F8. And I did, I also did a focus stack where the whole scene was very sharp from foreground all the way to background, but I actually like it with a very shallow depth of field. And the difference between focus and, and depth of focus. Focus is gonna be like when you put your focal sensor as you move your joystick around, and some of you may not even know that you can actually move the focal sensor. So read your camera manual, figure out how to move that little square that if you haven't moved it, it'll be right in the center. And when you start to understand, you can move it, depending on your camera, you can move it around the frame so that you can focus wherever you place that, that's what's gonna be sharp, regardless of the aperture setting you, you choose. You could pick F2.8, which is a very shallow, depth of focus, the focus isn't gonna penetrate into the scene very much, but where you place the focal sensor will be sharp. Or you could put it at F22, and then more the whole scene will be in focus, but really the difference between focus and depth of field is where you put the focal sensor will be sharp, will be in focus how far that focus extends into the scene depends on the aperture setting that you choose. That's the difference. Okay, here's a good example. It's another macro scene, but this one I did a focus stack of several dozen images because now you can see the spines of the, of the cactus. And I think I put the focal sensor on this big one to the sort of bottom right. But then I started to move the focal sensor throughout the whole scene, all the way into the dark, dark parts of the cactus, way deep into the cactus, so that it was many photos, several dozen that I stacked together so that 
now you have, you can see that where I place the focal sensor on that middle right, or sorry, lower right big cactus, that's sharp. But I moved the focal sensor all around until I got the depth of focus or a depth of attention that extends all the way through the scene so that you can see the spines all the way down to the base of the cactus are still sharp. Okay, um, anything else I want to make with this? Yeah, it just, it invites us to look through the whole image and because so much of the scene is sharp, you'll notice that your attention and your eye wanders throughout the scene and looking at the detail. In contrast to this, you probably will notice that your eye doesn't deviate a lot out of the pink and blue flowers. The green background just becomes a support, sort of diffuse color that your eye isn't really looking for details there because there isn't any. So shutter speed, next. Shutter speed allows us to freeze movement or create the perception of movement in a static image. This is a good example. This is from Vancouver Island where I used to live. And this was around a quarter of a second. And you'll see that because of the quarter second and these waves were really hitting these rocks hard. So you were getting a lot of spray coming off the rocks. And I didn't wanna freeze the action of those waves or the movement of those waves. So I chose a slower shutter speed. Obviously I'm on a tripod, I'm not gonna do this handheld. But that slow shutter speed allowed the individual water droplets to create these strands uh, that look sort of like cotton candy now. You can only do that through a show, slow shutter speed. So this is, that's part of what I was feeling from the moment. I wanted to just see and feel the spray, the whole sort of radial movement of the wave spraying in the um, spraying through the air, I wanted to capture that and freeze that. So it was an intentionally slow shutter speed. Um, can also create perception of a shallow depth of focus. Yes. So again, you can start to see the foreground rocks are very sharp and the background um, green foliage on the wall, you can see that that's softer because that was moving. So, you know, it, it was windy day and lots of spray from the water, all that really light foliage is moving. So you can start to see the rocks are crisp and clear and detailed and the back foliage is much softer. So it can create a, a sense of being a very shallow depth of field or a shallow depth of focus through the scene. So this was shot um, about one sixth of a second, sorry, I thought it was a quarter, one sixth. And I had an ND filter on just to slow it down because it was still you know, an hour or so before sunset. Okay. Again, using shutter speed to create the perception of movement. This is Grand Falls in Arizona, which is a very interesting place if you haven't been there and you going to Arizona ever, to, ever in usually the spring, like February, March is the best time. Sometimes it goes off during the monsoon. If it's big, big heavy rains in the summer, Grand Falls will run, but usually it's a sort of a phenomenon of spring melt from the White Mountains in Eastern Arizona that fills up the Little Colorado River. And because it's dry most of the year, it's picking up all the sand and the red rock dust and it turns the water orange. It's also called Chocolate Falls. I have another photo of it here, the next slide. But it's a huge waterfall, it rages. It, when it's at its peak, it has similar water volume to Niagara Falls. So it's a big waterfall, it's very impressive. And I wanted to give the perception of a softening. It's thunderous, you know, it's, when it's raging, it's thunderous, it's deafening and it's tons of spray. And I wanted to create a softer, more intimate feel with this. So I chose a um, slower shutter speed to blur the water. And I used, that's the ND filter. 
I used a shallow depth of field, F8. So what was actually in focus was just the rock and the tree. Everything before that or after that is going to be softer, which creates more soft blur in the water. And the ND filter on the front of the camera, which is a neutral density filter, is screwed onto the front of your camera. And they come in various stops from two stop all the way up to 20 stops, depending on how much light you're wanting to restrict into the camera. Very useful for slowing movement down, um, whether it's foliage moving, flowers waving in the wind, fall leaves, water, clouds moving. Um, very useful tool. So I used an ND filter with this as well, but intentional slow use of shutter speed. Again, similar. This is again from Vancouver Island. A very slow shutter speed of a quarter of a second to give the perception of, of movement in a static image. You know, these waves were rolling in, hitting these big rocks, and the spray was going 15, 20 feet in the air. And if I freeze the individual water droplets, you're not going to see that spray. You actually have to have the shutter open long enough so that as the water droplet moves through the air, it's creating a streak similar to star trails. This is like water trails, uh, water spray trails. So if the shutter speed is open when water is moving fast, you get this streaky effect. And it works. I love the look of this. Not everyone likes it. But this is part of going back to, you know, the creative intent and the technical execution. That if you understand the technical execution of these three to five primary camera settings, then you can have the camera translate, accurately translate your creative intent. My creative intent was um, water trails, water spray trails. Whether you like it or not, that was my creative intent, and that was the image that I used the camera settings to achieve. Otto would not have done this. Okay. ISO, ISO settings. Again, so this, think of this as like a volume switch for light sensitivity of our camera sensor. The sensor way in the back of the camera. The ISO dial here, when you push that ISO button and then dial it up or down, it's like a volume switch. It increases the sensitivity to light or turns the sensitivity of light down. The more sensitive the sensor becomes to light, the less light it's going to need to make an impression, a photographic impression. For instance, this was shot at 25 seconds, f2.8, so the aperture is wide open to let as much light through the front element as possible. ISO 3200, which is really high, and that supercharged the sensor. Front element open at 2.8, left the shutter speed open for 25 seconds. That's the result. Generally with starlight, if you go more than 30 seconds, the stars move, right? And they'll start to streak. So if you want the stars as pinpoints, you need to generally keep it under 30 seconds. That depends on your orientation to the North Star, which I, I go through in detail in my photo workshops. But um, yeah, this is the effect. You can actually see the Milky Way. And honestly, if any of you are from a dark sky area like Arizona, where I lived for 15 years, especially northern Arizona, not so much around Phoenix, <laughs> but um, northern Arizona, southern Utah, if you've been there in the night and you, you know, extinguish your cell phone and your headlamp and you just hang out there under the stars, your eyes will actually adjust. You can start to see something similar. It might not be quite this bright, but it's pretty amazing when you extinguish all light and you're in an area that has minimal light pollution, just high, how um, sensitive our eyes become to seeing starlight. It's really amazing. If you haven't done it, definitely recommend it. 
So that's a little bit about ISO. Um, here's Grand Falls again, shot at night. This is where it really looks like Chocolate Falls. And um, yeah, this was a really difficult image to get. Uh, camera settings were 3200, 2.8, 20 seconds. But then I used a split grad. Split grad is sort of like, imagine this being a piece of glass and the top portion of the glass is really dark and the bottom portion of the glass is clear. So I would put the bottom, I'd put that dividing line between dark and light right at the horizon so that I was cutting light down from the sky because it was much darker than the waterfalls and then the clear glass at the waterfalls and it just allowed the balance, the exposure to balance out more. But this is, well, none of these photos you could do in auto mode, which I'm really trying to bring that back to the primary point of, this is um, a marriage of technical and creativity, that the technical and the creative can come together in one coherent experience in the moment that you understand your camera settings well enough and are clear enough with your creative intent so that they can come together in an accurate translation of what you are seeing, sensing, and feeling in the moment. So I think this is a reasonably good um, representation of that. Exposure compensation. Now this is where things shifted for me. I shot for years and years with DSLRs which are optical viewfinders, which means they have a mirror in them. And when you look through the viewfinder of a DSLR, it's, a, it's an optical, it's a, it's a, meaning it's a glass prism in which you're looking through the image that is being seen by the camera through the front element is reflected off the mirror. And you're seeing that representation in the camera, in the viewfinder. Mirrorless cameras don't work like that. Mirrorless cameras have what's called an electronic viewfinder, which means it's a electronically or computer generated image of what the sensor is seeing. It takes some getting used to. And I think the, um, the digital viewfinders are becoming more and more accurate to where now I actually prefer them. That's one key fun difference between mirrorless and, and DSLRs. And the other key difference is when you look through your camera and you see the rectangle box of your viewfinder, with DSLR cameras, there's a box within the box. And the small box within that box is the only area that you can move the focal sensor. That drove me nuts for years. I got really put off by that because it limits my creative intent. I want to be able to move the focal sensor where I want to move it from edge to edge, top edge, bottom edge, side to side, because oftentimes this is part of my creative intent with my composition. Because as you know, now where I place that focal sensor is going to take an exposure reading and a focus reading. And that's really important in the translation of how and where I want the viewer to look. Mirrorless cameras allow me to move that wherever in the viewfinder. DSLR cameras, you can do that on live view. You can move the focal sensor, but I like the immersive experience of the viewfinder of the eyepiece, where I just put my eye up to the camera. I oftentimes block this eye out so that I'm immersed in the scene. This is really important and something that I teach in my workshops is to really allow yourself to become immersed with the composition. We'll notice a lot more flaws in the composition or distracting elements that shouldn't be there. We're trying to shoot off live view for especially landscapes. Um, you're your brain is competing with all sorts of, if I'm shooting like this through live view, 
and I'm seeing all sorts of light and seeing and moving objects, it's very hard for my brain to be immersed in that experience and for me to really feel what's actually happening. So I block out all the light and I use the viewfinder and I want to have creative liberty to move that focal center wherever I want. That's the huge part of my compositions is being able to move the focal center exactly where I want. So how does that relate to exposure compensation? Because if you're shooting in, like the other key difference, when I was shooting DSLR cameras, I would shoot in aperture priority. And the reason is, this is another key difference from optical viewfinder to electronic viewfinder. When you're making exposure compensations, either through aperture dial, front on this camera, shutter speed back of the camera, ISO here on the camera. Whenever I move those dials in a mirrorless camera, in an electronic viewfinder, I see the exposure change in real time. That doesn't happen with DSLR cameras, which is why you can be changing your shutter speed or your aperture. You're looking through a DSLR camera, an optical viewfinder camera, you won't see the exposure change. Aperture settings for me make a lot more sense when I can't see the exposure change. Then all I have to worry about when I was shooting DSLRs is the aperture and the depth of focus and how to either add light or subtract light. That's what exposure compensation does. Minus exposure compensation takes light away from the scene. Plus, comp plus exposure compensation adds light to the scene. It's the easiest way to remember it. So when I hit the exposure compensation button and I, for every click I move of the front wheel here, it takes a third of a stop of the light away. If I'm shooting DSLR cameras where when I'm looking through the viewfinder and I'm making these changes and I don't see any change with the exposure comp, exposure compensation button, which is almost universally right here on most every camera right there, that will allow you to change the exposure compensation, but you have to understand that you're not seeing that in the viewfinder. Mirrorless cameras, I think, are a huge advantage for that reason because every move I make of either shutter speed, ISO, or aperture, I see the exposure changing in real time in the viewfinder. Then I don't have to worry about exposure compensation. I can just move shutter speed, aperture, depending on if I want to affect depth of focus or movement. Depth of focus would be aperture. Movement would be shutter speed. ISO would be sensitivity, the volume switch. And I can adjust all of those in real time and I see it happening in the viewfinder or on the back of the screen if I'm shooting live view. That's a huge advantage because then, remember the five essential camera settings of aperture, shutter speed, ISO, um, exposure compensation, and focal sensor placement, it knocks one of those out. Now I only have to pay attention to four. And actually, I can oftentimes get rid of shutter speed if I'm shooting land, um, landscapes. I'm oftentimes more concerned about depth of focus, but it reduces the variables to four instead of five. Anything I can do to reduce my interface with the camera or minimize it in a really effective way, and I can stay more focused on what I'm photographing, then I'm not, my attention isn't fixated on the camera. It's, it's um, paying attention to changing light, to animals, to birds, to clouds, to water, to, because as we know in nature, in really high stakes light, things are shifting so quick. And if we're trying to control everything about our camera, we're fixated on our camera and not what we love to shoot. So that becomes a real problem.
this is the advantage of simplifying your interface with your camera to either four with mirrorless or five with DSLR cameras. Focal sensor placement, this is a good example of the importance of that. By default, most cameras look um, lock the exposure and the focus values right from where you place the focal sensor. So I mentioned this before, but you can change that. Um, I won't get into that in this, I do in the workshops, and I might talk a little bit about that in next week's webinar on, um, on, on creativity. Otherwise, your camera will decide what your exposure will be and where you want, and where, where it wants you to focus. So if, for instance, if my camera sensor was locked in the center, I couldn't have got this composition. I needed to be able to move the focal sensor to the bear's head. He was drinking and occasionally was looking back at us and I didn't want to get him drinking. So as his head was down, I just placed the focal sensor where his head would be when he lifted his head. As soon as he lifted his head, the focal sensor is there, the focus is locked, the depth of focus is locked, and use a very shallow depth of field, and as slow a shutter speed as I could to freeze the movement. So if I'm on auto mode, you can't get this photo. I wanted a lot of the very soft background above him and place him low in the scene. So that's a good example of the importance of being able to position your focal sensor where you want it for the action and anticipating the action in this case. Again, here, if my focal sensor is in the center, none of the cave around there would be sharp. This is a, this is a focus stack again. I had to put the focal sensor all through the whole scene, both the background scene and the foreground walls of the cave but I have to be able to place the focal sensor to adjust, uh, to lock the exposure, sorry, lock the focus where I want and to control the exposure. So this is a good example of how to work focal sensor placement and why a centered focal placement, focal sensor placement wouldn't work. The only thing that would be in focus is um, the background red rocks, that's all. And the whole cave would be soft and out of focus. Okay, so um, that's it. I hope you guys wrote down some questions. Let me open chat here. I have to get out of my keynote presentation for this cursor to work. So let me, come on. Chat. Okay. Thank Does you. Any does anyone, you can, you don't have to write your chat too. If you want to unmute yourself, you can unmute and ask a question. Or if you want to write it in chat, you can do that as well. Just wanted to say thank you. Enjoyed that very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for attending. Anyone else have any questions? Really, was it that straightforward and comprehensive that there's zero questions? <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Any new insights? that you learned from this. Maybe share an insight or two. Do you feel like this will be useful in your photography going forward? And maybe if you come on and you wanna share something, just um, share with me your name. Well, my name is Sonda. And the one thing that I guess I need to read my manual as you suggested is yep. how, uh, how you can find more than one focal sensor placement. Yeah, so probably, I mean, every manufacturer is a little bit different, but generally it's called a focal sensor. So 
in, in, you know, in the front of your camera manual where they have all the diagrams, the pictures of showing you all the buttons and dials, and then they show you a screen, like a, a, a diagram of what you would see through your viewfinder, and they label all those things, that might be a useful place to start to look to see if you can find where they've labeled, how they call it, focal sensors. And then, like for a lot of cameras, not um, not the mirrorless, but on the central button at the back, it often has a toggle switch to it. And if it's toggled one way or the other, that tends to lock the focal sensors. So start with that. See if the central button on the back of your camera has a toggle switch. Move that and then use the little joystick with Nikons, it has a joystick up here or this circular wheel I can press on it on either side, top or bottom, and that will move the focal sensor. So yeah, you, you really got to get the focal sensor off the center because you're really limiting what your camera can do. You have to take control of that because that's the point where you're going to be able to direct the viewer's attention. Is that helpful? Yeah, I found, as a matter of fact, I found it on one. I'm just trying to see how I can get a second one in there. Because you said you can focus on more than one. Oh, yes. This is going to get more into advanced camera settings. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'll briefly say, in the simplest mode, there will be one focal sensor that can be positioned anywhere within a box if you're shooting a DSLR or anywhere in the frame. There's additional camera settings that activate multiple focal sensors at one time. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. That's more advanced. Just right now, work on finding the how to move the one central focal sensor and then move that around the scene. If you feel like you've got that, and you want to start to explore different focal sensor arrays that would cover larger objects, like a single point to track a bird is very hard. But if you can activate multiple focal sensors, like maybe four to six or eight all at once, it's much easier to keep a moving object like a bird in multiple focal sensors as opposed to a single focal sensor. I don't know if that makes sense, but and this is also something that I work with people doing private mentoring of just helping people work where they are and then advance their skills so that they can um, progress over time and understand these are complicated instruments, really complicated. Start by simplifying. Start by just working with these five settings and see what that gets you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else? Insights? Is this going to be useful for you? These well, are things. <laughs> oh, good. Great. Yeah, you know, these are things that I encourage people to practice or get acquainted with before they come to a workshop. Just even understand how to adjust these camera settings. So when we're in the field shooting and I say, adjust your aperture to this or your shutter speed to that, you don't have to understand what they're necessarily doing, but it's really helpful to understand where they are and how to actually adjust them. Because that's a huge part of the field work that I do is really working with these basic four to five settings in a repetitious way so that we start to really understand and, and lock that knowledge in. And once that knowledge is locked in, then we're not stuck in this sort of left brain figuring things out behind the camera when, we, when we're in high stakes light and so many things are changing. We wanna be able to have some level of um, confidence with these camera settings so that when we're in higher stakes situation and lights going off, then we can actually shift our experience intentionally. 
that we can shift more into a felt sense. We can attune to our breath, our body, what we're sensing and feeling, and not just be fixated on the camera. Because all of that really can strongly inform your creative expression in the moment. Then when you can pay attention to what you're seeing, sensing, feeling, being open and receptive and responsive to the light as it's changing, then it's just a matter of translating that with some confidence because you understand what camera settings will be needed to make that translation accurately. Is that helpful? Yes, you also mentioned um, the dark skies and I live in Southern Arizona, so I know what you're talking about. Yep. And if we wanted to just say shoot at the stars, um, you would, what would you do? You would uh, do the light sensitivity, you would turn it all the way down, or all the way up, which way does that go? Yeah, so, well, a couple of things I'll say. What I also do in the photo workshops is we do a fair bit of work without the cameras where we'll just do some nature walks. It's just really observing and really attuning to the light because we are dynamic receptors and reflectors of light when we put ourselves in any form of light, whether it's harsh, I mean, think about it. Go into an office environment where it's bare neon tubes and see how you feel. Don't, not even just what you're thinking, Notice how your body responds to that. And then put yourself in some of the most exquisite, beautiful scenes that you've seen in nature and notice how your body responds differently, how your nervous system responds to light. That's really important. It's so easy to get fixated with these of like, we drive to a place at dark skies and night, we're under headlights and got our headlamp on and we pull the camera out and set it on a tripod, we know the settings and just start popping. And to me, that's a real missed opportunity. You get a, a nice photo, you might even get something exceptional. But I think there's a real opportunity missed in that what I would suggest is getting to your location, plenty of time, maybe you can see the transition from sunset into darkness and really start to notice how that impacts your mind, your body, how you feel, how you sense, your breath. And really immerse yourself in that experience so that it becomes something that is really imprinted into a felt sense of how you transition through light. Let your eyes adjust. Turn off your headlight, your devices, your phones, headlamps, anything for a half hour and just sit under the stars and let that impress upon you um, how light can inform our creative expression. Instead of having a formula, okay, 3200, F2.8, wide angle, um, <laughs> it's a formula, right? And you know the formula and it'll get you a reasonable photo. But like that Grand, Grand Falls shot that I showed you of the five stop graduated ND, that was not formula driven. That was really just experientially driven and informed in the moment. I had no intention of shooting starlight that night. Um, but as I just sat on the rim, listening and watching the water and seeing how the light was just sort of dancing off the spray of the water, it was like, wow, that's amazing. No formula could have informed me of that moment. So that's more what I'm talking about. That's the creative. And then, thankfully, I knew the technical. It's like, okay, now there's real technical things that I have to do in order to execute that creative sense of the moment and what I was experiencing. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Thank you. And I, I know I didn't fully answer your question with ISO, but the, the more you increase ISO, Generally, the base ISO for cameras is somewhere between 50 and 200, depending on the camera, which is not going to allow you to get a good starlight shot. So you increase the ISO. You generally open the aperture all the way up so it, most light can get into the front element. Increase your ISO. And somewhere, depending on how much moonlight there is out, but I'd say anywhere from 800 to 3200, 
is going to start to give you some pretty good results. And, and that'll show on the camera. That's not one of those that you said, like the exposure uh, compensation you won't see. So this you will see as you're ready to shoot. Depends. Now, on a, this is the disadvantage of, again, a DSLR, or a slight disadvantage. When you look through an optical viewfinder at night, like any of you that have a DSLR and you look through an optical viewfinder at night, what do you see? <laughs> not much, right? It's dark. These mirrorless cameras, when I look through the viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder at night, and I start to increase the ISO settings up, the image starts to brighten, brighten, brighten. It's fuzzy, but it gives me a good, it's way better to compose with a mirrorless camera at night than a DSLR camera, in my experience. The DSLR camera, I'm experimenting. I just sort of like take a shot, look at the expo, look at the see, look at, do an image review on the LCD or in this in the viewfinder. Then I make the exp, the composition adjustment because I can't see the scene through the viewfinder. With a mirrorless camera, I can see the scene, so it's much less experimenting, and I can usually lock in my composition much easier at night with a mirrorless camera than a DSLR camera. So it takes some experimenting is what I'm saying. With a DSLR, you have to take a few shots, adjust your exposure, or sorry, adjust your composition a little bit each time till you get the composition you want. And then you're good to go. Um, the other thing with nighttime images, <clears throat> this is more into advanced camera settings, but I'll just touch on it briefly. Don't judge the quality of your photo by what you see on your LCD. It's probably the biggest mistake most beginner novice photographers make. What I tell my students in the field and in the classroom is expose to the right as far as you can without clipping highlights. And you'll see that in the histogram. If you expose to the right and you get a spike up the side of the histogram, you've burnt out highlights. Push the histogram as far to the right as you can. The photo will not look good on your LCD. Daytime photos will look really bright and washed out and colorless. Don't worry about it. This is what I talk about in my Transforming Your Passion into Pixels course. Expose for the right, expose to the right, very bright image. Then you have a ton of information to work with in the photo processing. With nighttime images, it's going to probably look pretty dark on the back of your LCD. Don't expect it to look like um, this is not what my photo looked like on the back of my LCD. This oh. is a lot of image processing to bring out shadow detail. So if you're shooting starlight, do not expect that. Do not expect to see that on your LCD. You won't. OK. OK. Thank you. So yeah, there's a translation. There's a translation. There's two levels of, two big levels of sort of thresholds or translations. It's first one is in the field, translating your creative experience or intent into the technical execution of your camera. That's one translation. The second translation is taking the raw photo from your camera and then translating it through the processing experience of editing the photo. Really both super important. That's what brings artistic and creative continuity from capture to final output. Creative intent to technical execution to image processing to the final output. And then what you've seen, sensed, and felt, your creative experience in the moment is accurately translated to a photo like this. Like it or not, that captures everything that I seen, sensed, and felt that night. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Time for dinner. Oh, I see a question here. Yes, there will be a recording. Um, if I have, it's, it's from me, Shane, and I had a, a, a lot of trouble getting in. 
I got your confirmation oh, from me. I got a confirmation from Meetup when I registered, but I never got the password. So I oh. had to re-register, and then I waited and waited to be let in, and finally uh, it was too late. So okay, I just came very late, but I wanted to explain why. Also, yeah. there was a change in the time because the meetup said six o'clock, and then I looked further in your description and it said 5.30, so I don't even know what time it actually started. Ah, geez, did I make that mistake? It doesn't surprise so, me. So just so uh, you're aware, because you know, there's stuff you should always recheck. Meetup yeah. has got its own deficiencies, I understand. Yeah. I've got enough. And then I coupled that with Meetup and we're in a world yeah. of hurt. So um, <laughs> anyway, but, as please, long as you please. send the recording, I'm fine. Yes, I will. Please, Thank you. Anyone that's on the call and wants the recording, please email me because I don't know if I can post this to Meetup. I don't think I can. No, you have to send it individually, I think. Yeah, you so can put I it on Vimeo post. or somewhere else. I will contact everyone that signed up through Meetup, and, and I'll, I'll message everyone and tell you to send me your email so I can send you the recording. But if you want to be proactive and just send me your email, I'll make sure you get the recording tomorrow. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Great. And so you can get in. I needed a refresh from signing up a year and a half ago when it was in person. Right. <laughs> I needed a refresh from camera settings. <laughs> Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. That's usually what it takes with camera settings. Oh, yeah. One time is not enough. <laughs> no, no. It's simple, but it takes repeated exposure and practice. Low stakes practice, again, is just so crucial. All right. Um, great. Got an email. Okay. Any other questions, insights, shares that anyone wants to make? If you want an opportunity to practice this in the field, um, those of you on Meetup know that I posted a couple of fall colors workshops. One's gonna be at Crested Butte and the other one's gonna be in Ridgeway. Both are three days. And this is gonna be a great opportunity to work this in practical ways in the field where I can be right there with you, helping you with the camera settings. And, um, yeah, and learning to make that creative translation from the creative intent and experience into technical execution. It's, it's really a paramount threshold to move into and through for photographers that really aspire to sort of evolve their artistic creative expression, that we're able to make that translation from creativity to technical execution. So there's the Crested Butte workshop is full. There's three spots currently for the Ridgeway workshop. We're gonna be doing at least six hours a day of field work, sunrise and sunset for three days straight. So if anyone wants to jump in on that, I would love to see you and work with you in the field. Okay, anything else? There's not any other questions or shares that people want to make. I'm going to wrap this up. OK, everyone. Well, thank you so much for attending. Um, hope you got something out of this. And I look forward to sharing with you next week. That's going to be um, awakening your creative expression. It's all about creativity. So hope to see you then. Have a great week. Thank Bye -bye. you. I will make sure I sign on correctly. <laughs> Thank sure. you. Bye.